The SEA exam is a secondary school placement exam that some say is as relevant as Pastor Coffee's hairstyle. Or a degree from the University of the West Indies. Every year, about 17,000 children as young as 11 write the SEA exam. And every year, parents and other educated people call for the exam to be abolished, citing the negative impacts it has on children and society, depression, self-harm, in some cases physical and mental abuse, racial and ethnic inequality. But it's 2020 and the exam is still around. In early January, the ministry announced that 19,363 students will write the exam, 9,772 males and 9,551 females. Now I know that calculators aren't allowed in the exam. But I didn't know that calculators aren't allowed in the Ministry of Education. Although the Ministry of Education will tell you that they are in fact looking for an alternative method for transitioning students, they are yet to come up with a formula that wouldn't offend the church and other religious groups. You see, religious groups have a very important role in this story. We're talking about the Christian churches, the Muslims and the Mahasabha Damahama you know what I'm talking about. So some say that 11 and 12 year old children are too young for the exam. Parents suffer too. Can you imagine having a child that writes the exam twice and passes for their last choice? Twice. Dear Ministry of Education, for security reasons, please don't publish my child's name in the daily newspapers. Placement in a secondary school is based on merit, choice of schools and gender. At least that's what they say. Each school has cutoff scores, which is an established score used to filter out unqualified candidates. Apparently these scores change from year to year. So based on an unofficial document from 2008, the cutoff scores for Eldorado West Secondary was 55 to 85% and the cutoff scores for Hillview College and St. Joseph's Convent were 90 to 99%. It sounds fair and straightforward. Right? Not everyone thinks so. And that includes some politicians and leading thinkers. Like everything else, the SEA exam has positives and negatives. Let's start with the positives. SEA or common entrance results quickly help you establish how bright or duncy someone is. For example, when I wrote common entrance, my four choices were St. George's College, Tunapuna Secondary, St. Joseph Convent, and El Dorado Secondary. My parents didn't interfere. They, they should have, but they didn't. The only thing they asked me was, what about Hillview College? To which I responded, nah, that school had too much man. Long story short, I didn't pass for convent. I passed for my last choice, which back then made me the dunciest child in the family. But all that changed. Time passed, I studied hard, I worked hard, and years later, my cousin failed common entrance twice. She still works in a gas station. The common entrance curse is real. If you fail common entrance, the only place you could find work is in a gas station. It's on the application form. You have to tick it off. I failed common entrance twice. No, before SEA, there was the common entrance exam. And before that, the college exhibition exam. As far back as 1835, there were denominational primary and single sex secondary schools. St. Mary's College, St. Joseph's Convent, Naprima Gills, Presentation College, Asja Boys and Gills, Vishnu Boys, Hindu School. Because these denominational schools performed well, they developed a reputation. They became first choice schools, the prestige schools. Since colonial times, secondary education was highly valued. It had to be good, right? It came from England, white man thing. But before 1960, places in schools were restricted. Limited space, high demand, and stiff competition meant some method of selection was required. Records from back then highlight negative consequences. Segregation, bright students in one class, the dunce head ones in another. Extra lessons, before and after school. Focus on the examination versus the full syllabus. Heavy books, heavy bags, bossy back children. Songs familiar, right? Despite criticism, the system survived. It evolved into common entrance. For political mileage, the government did something in 1960 that would inadvertently fuel division and discord. They signed an agreement called the Concordat of 1960. A Concordat is an agreement or treaty, especially one between the Vatican and a secular government. You know, for some reason, the word Concordat reminds me of video games. I don't know why. Understanding the Concordat requires a little bit of backstory. Trinidad's first prime minister, Eric Williams, wanted a second education for all and promised changes. Sweeping changes that would affect denominational schools. The government had two good reasons for wanting to curb religious interest. One, to merge the diverse population into a functioning state and not separate children along religious lines. And secondly, the government wanted to give equal opportunity 
to all. Yet, according to one article, the religious schools are more blessed. They cater to higher income students, receive government subsidies, and are more successful than state schools in raising private funds. The different religious interests, led by and perhaps inspired by the Catholic Church, saw these changes as a threat to their followers, communities, and the coins in the collection plate. So the religious bodies, they pushed back, more than Famanapi's hairline. The government, fearing the impact the Catholic Church could have on an upcoming election, signed the Concordat, which also bought the government time to organize a state-run school system. Ah, I now know why the word conquer that reminds me of video games. Somebody ever ask if you played this game or that game and you're like, yeah, I conquered that already. The conquer that opened previously closed doors for school children. Because based on the agreement, denominational schools would accept 80% of the students based on their performance in the common entrance exam. The conquer that also assures the preservation of the character of the denominational schools. To this day, the state assists denominational schools, paying teachers, supplying textbooks, providing security, and it gives denominational schools the right to veto or reject books, which is reasonable, right? It also allows the school to handpick 20% of their annual intake, regardless of a student's performance, which works well, particularly for rich kids. It also allows the school to reject teachers. In 2018, a Hindu school prevented a Muslim trainee teacher from wearing a hijab. So while Section 4 of Trinidad's constitution upholds a citizen's right to religious expression, the Concordat gives denominational schools the right to reject teachers based on moral or religious grounds, which sounds reasonable. Right, Satmaraj? To this day, politicians talk about reviewing the document, but they don't. There's not much the state could do because of the Concordat. In the 1970s, the government built a number of junior secondary schools to address the shortage of school places. To accommodate even more students, they implemented a two-shift system. More schools meant more votes. Former Prime Minister Bastio Pande vowed to get rid of the common entrance exam. This is back in 1998. 12 years before his former Minister of Education, Kamala Prasad Bisesa, got rid of him. In the UNC's 2002 manifesto, current opposition leader Kamala Prasad Bisesa boasts about three things. The abolition of the common entrance exam, the introduction of the SEA exam, and universal secondary education. To facilitate education for all, the UNC built 29 new secondary schools. More schools, more votes. Education went from being a privilege to being a right. Pass or fail, every student progressed into secondary school. Because every student was guaranteed a place, the exam was no longer about placement. It was about who got into a prestige school. In 2014, Alta's founder, Paula Lucy Smith, described the abolition of the common entrance exam and the introduction of universal secondary education as a disastrous decision that placed hundreds of non-readers in secondary schools. Students who had not mastered the primary curriculum were expected to do a secondary curriculum. Research links delinquency and violence with illiteracy. In an article titled Anger Pervades Our Secondary Schools, she writes, Politics should not dictate education policies. No politics, no religion. In 2012, to develop well-rounded students, a continuous assessment program was introduced. The component was structured in a way to ensure students didn't fall below the 30% bracket, which happens to an average 2,500 students every year. Believe it or not, there are cases where some students scored zero in the SEA exam. Which means they didn't even sign the exam paper. Because everyone knows you get one mark for writing your name. On April 1st, 2016, the current Minister of Education, Anthony Garcia, scrapped the continuous assessment component. Why not scrap the exam? And why announce news like this on All Fool's Day? And have you ever realized that if you squint, Anthony Garcia looks like Whoopi Goldberg? If you're still watching this video, thank you very much for sticking around. It's a long video. The inner workings of student placement is ordinarily hidden from public view. It's a black hole, dark and incomprehensible like the bags under Gary Griffith's eyes. Despite decades of exams, there's limited data in the public domain. For good reason, perhaps. It's sensitive data about children. There is, however, one downside. People are afraid of what they don't understand. Naturally, the lack of data and transparency lends itself to speculation about the placement process among citizens and leading thinkers. In 2018, a detailed database of secondary entrance assessment results was accidentally published online. Remember the Concordat, the 80% rule? And 20% rule that allows the school to place students as they see fit. Analysis of the leaked data showed that in some instances, denominational schools assigned as many as 33% of students out of sequence. Which might explain the dunce 
she had boy or the Dunsey had Catholic girl sitting down next to you? How on earth did she pass for convent? The ministry's chief education officer described the research as flawed, but the can of worms had already been opened or reopened. Girls are outperforming boys because research shows that girls are better at solving and creating problems. Statistics show that students from Goodwood Gardens, West Moorings, and Bayshore are more likely to pass for their first choice when compared to students from Carnage or La Hoqueta. One researcher in a quest to understand the racial effects of the 20% rule used SEA results published in the Express newspapers and in their names as a proxy for the race of children. That doesn't make sense, it sounds like it does, but it doesn't. That's like saying every Indian is a Hindu or everyone named Ali is a Muslim. Whether or not you reject the research, it shows an astronomical high placement of children with Indian names in prestige schools. Whether those schools are Hindu, Presbyterian, Catholic, or government. In 2011, 14 students from one class in a Shagwana school placed in the top 100 SEA students. Allegations of cheating surfaced. In a letter published online and attributed to Dr. Selwyn Kujo, he wrote to the then Minister of Education, Dr. Tim Gopi Singh. Asking him to examine the situation to find out whether anything untoward happened because according to a leading maths man, unless the teacher was the most brilliant teacher, and unless these 14 students were the most brilliant in the world, the chances were 1 trillion to 1 that such a result was possible. The letter never raised the issue of race, but it's quite likely that based on the location, Shagwanas, and the surnames, a lot of assumptions can be made. And these assumptions can divide Trinidad into two camps. On one side, you could have the East Indians saying that them African and them only jealous. And in the other camp, you could have the Africans saying, them Indian and them could really tiff, you know. In 1988, the Calypsonian Krokro sang about corruption in common entrance, Indian successes, Africans in junior secondary schools, references to cheating, favoritism, gender gaps, racial achievement gaps. Every year, the top students on the front page, a news story here and there about one or two beat-em students who defied the odds. Will these problems end if we abolish the SEA exam? Or dismantle the Concordat? Or will the trends continue? Competition over cooperation. Maybe you're watching this video in the distant future. It's 2060. Rumor has it that people still change their surnames and religions to get their kids into prestige schools. There are even rumors of boys who had a sex change and they go in girls' schools. Redwall News. It better than blues.